Welcome today to our webinar. My name is Rachel McIntosh. I'm a cryptocurrency journalist and podcast host at Finance Magnates. And I am so pleased to be chatting today with a truly amazing group of thought leaders from across the crypto world. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves a little bit more thoroughly in just a moment. But I'll say shortly that we have Konstantin Anisimov from CEX.io, Graham Rodford from Archax, Hayden Jones from PwC and John Paul Clothier from IFIS, excuse me. Uh, and as I said, I'll let each of them introduce themselves in just a moment. But before then, a few housekeeping matters and a little bit of context about this webinar today. So we are here today to discuss the position of institutional investors in crypto, whether their presence in this market is necessary for further growth, what can make institutional players become more confident about investing in crypto, and how how institutional investors can potentially influence the direction in which cryptocurrency markets will develop going forward. Our talk today is going to last for about 45 minutes, so after that point, the floor will be opened up for questions. We'd love to hear from you during today's webinar, so if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, if we don't get to your question today, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webinar is over. This webinar will be available on demand after today's live session. So if you miss anything, no worries at all. We will be sending a link to the on-demand recording uh, when it's available. And you'll also find some information there about other webinars and other content that we have on our channel. Uh, last but not least, sharing is caring. We'd love to encourage you to share today's webinar on your social networks, let people know that you were here. So without any further ado, let's get this conversation rolling. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. So happy to have you all here. Thanks, Rachel. Yes. It's so as I said, I'd like all of you to introduce yourself. So uh, we'll start with Constantine. Uh, yes. Thank you, Rachel. So I'm uh, the executive director of CXIO. Uh, we started off as a retail cryptocurrency exchange back in 2013 and are one of the longest running uh, and regulated cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, in the last two years or so, we've been um, adjusting our business and pivoting towards building a complete uh, cryptocurrency ecosystem with a whole multitude of uh, service offerings, including retail and institutional, uh, including direct uh, trading like spot uh, trading, as well as staking, savings, uh, and many other offerings, uh, which will happen very, very, will, which will be introduced very, very soon. Wonderful. Thank you, Constantine. Uh, next, we'll pivot to Graham. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. So I'm Graham, the co-founder and CEO of Artax in London, um, background in asset management, interested in, in crypto from 2013, and in around 2018, tried to launch a hedge fund in, in the crypto space and just realized that the infrastructure wasn't where it should be for institutions. So myself, the, the CFO and CTO set up Archax in 2018, uh, applied to be regulated in the UK and last year became the UK's first regulated digital securities exchange custodian and the UK's first registered crypto asset company as well. So launching later on this year, targeting institutions and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Lovely, thank you so much, Graham. Uh, next we have Hayden. So Hayden Jones, thank you for this, Rachel. Hayden Jones, so I lead the uh, crypto blockchain practice for PwC UK. Uh, I've got a background in uh, investment banking principally, but also spent time at uh, the Bank of England, also the FSA, as it was then. Um, like Graham, I got into uh, crypto about 2013, and then uh, that was followed by mining. So I was mining Bitcoin for a period of time, which was, uh, was a lot of fun, but it was very dangerous. Uh, and then about uh, about five years ago, I thought this actually is really, really important technology and decided to to make a career of it and um, work through, you know, different organizations eventually arriving at PwC. And, um, you know, we take great pride in being able to work with our wonderful customers and support them through that journey, whether it's authorization, tax, legal, regulatory or structuring matters. We've got some wonderful expertise across our different lines of service and, um you know, very progressive uh, organization in terms of, you know, how crypto and blockchain can be used to improve problems in society. So it's a pleasure and looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Hayden. And uh, we saved the best for last. Uh, John Paul Clothier. Thanks, Rachel. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, John Paul Clothier. I'm Vice President for Payments for FIS in Europe, uh, which encompasses a, a role that you know, includes our, our card issuing business, our payment services business. 
uh, working with a very very broad range of clients, banks, retailers, program managers, uh, fintechs, and equally starting to, to work with, with a growing number of crypto exchanges as well. Um, FIS shifts 79 billion uh, transactions every year and over $10 trillion. Um, and it's great to see how we can leverage some of our investments and our capabilities to service this, this growing industry. Wonderful. Thank you all. So let's start by just talking about the past year in crypto. This has been a very interesting year for the space. A lot of changes throughout 2020 and 2021. So um, I'd like to ask each of you just to give us an overview of what you think the most important developments in crypto have been over the past year. And please feel free to jump in dynamically. I don't mind kicking us off. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, across a number of fronts, things changed, things changed um, this year. Um, most notably for us was I really noticed this year became the year where it was impossible to, to keep up with the space. The amount of development that's happening in terms of the protocols, the technology, the mining, the regulation, DeFi, NFTs, that the space has completely exploded. And, and before this year, uh, you know, desperately tried to, to keep up with all of those areas, but now it's practically impossible. And when you consider overlaying that with how the regulation and laws change on a global basis, you, you really can no longer be kind of an expert of everything in crypto that, that I think you could before. So yeah, I think that's a huge change for the, for the topic we're talking about with institutions um, and regulators as well. When they're looking out and considering how do they regulate this space, how should they change existing regulation? They have so many different business models to, to consider. And then in parallel with that, you've had this increased user adoption. So um, both in traditional and digital world, you've seen retail users want to be closer to markets, the removal of intermediaries using direct access to, to markets and an, and an explosion in crypto interest from institutions as well growth of digital trading desks, an increased number of exchange traded products, some getting access to crypto through treasury holdings on, on traditional securities. So, you know, I guess, you know, parallel things happen in the asset class exploding as well as, you know, huge change in, in the technology and the regs. And I think to, to add to this, Graham, uh, one, uh, one piece of development, which which happens, which is happening all around the world right now, which is going to be very much in my mind influencing the adoption of crypto in general for the general public is central bank digital currencies. I, I believe that this will shift the paradigm of um, a kind of. I, I, at the moment, there's still the majority of the population still believe that they need to be able to touch and feel their cash and, and have something physical in their hands to believe it's it's the real uh, money. Whereas once CBDCs come out, the, there will be a potential for the cash to be abolished completely. And, and the general public will have to adapt to the fact that, that money is digital. Um, and that in, in essence will, um, in my mind, will drive adoption of cryptocurrency and cryptographic money in general uh, way, way up. I, I think, and, you know, to echo um, you know, those words from Con and, and Graham, I think there's only one word for it really, which is explosion. Um, it's quite shocking because I think I did a presentation, um, it was about six, six weeks ago. And one of the things I always sort of pose, you know, how many cryptocurrencies are out there? And, you know, you get 30 or 40 or a hundred or whatever. And I think the morning of the presentation, I think I checked the number and it was just over 11,000. Okay. 11,000 cryptocurrencies. And I think by the time I did the presentation in the afternoon, I think it had gone up by 20. Um, and I think we're currently running about 11,000 to, it's about 11,200 or so cryptocurrencies. I'm actually checked the number today, but, but the problem, and it Graham makes the point. I mean, the problem, the problem is how do you navigate 11,200 things? It's like going into Sainsbury's and trying to, we need, we need aisles that say, well, we've got stable coins here. We've got our DeFi's here. We've got our exchange tokens here. We've got our securities here. And then you've got the different brands as you work your way around. And it's, it's incredibly complex for, for the consumer, you know, for the wholesale investor, uh, but also for the regulator to, to navigate. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's a good segmentation there, your stable coins, your exchange tokens, DeFi, your NFTs. And then, you know, as Con said, I think that the, the advent of the CBDC really will, you know, provide a, you know, a further, you know, level of legitimacy as a backdrop in relation to this whole space as, as a technology. Yeah, I, I think explosion is a great way to describe it. I mean, crypto exchanges are some of the, our largest clients within our e-commerce space. And I think certainly over the last, last couple of years, we've seen transaction growth of 
over 600%, um, which is great, you know, and it's very exciting. Um, and it's all about finding new ways to, to handle those cryptos, to make sure we get it on the street and obviously giving the service which, which consumers are going to be looking for going forward. Definitely. And, and I, I always come back to this point uh, that the New York Times said earlier this year that we're all crypto people now. And I really think that that's true. You know, we've been talking for years about how crypto is entering the mainstream and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But this year, it really did seem to happen, you know, not only with, as you said, these 11,200 cryptocurrencies, um, Hayden, but but also the advent of NFTs and the 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 merge of the pop world or the art world with crypto, things are changing very quickly. And there's been a lot of positive things that have happened, uh, obviously, in the last year, but there are still some key areas where the industry is falling short and maybe not necessarily meeting customer demands, particularly when it comes to institutional clients. So my next question for you all um, is, is how is the, how, how do you see the industry still needing to grow? Um, if, if, if I may uh, take this one to start with, uh, I think one of the things that, that is impeding institutional growth at the moment is clarity and regulation. And, it's, and I'm not saying that it's not there. It's, it's definitely being created and it's getting better and better every, maybe every couple of months right now. The pace is also, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that the pace at which the regulators are keeping up with this is also quite, quite uh, impressive uh, compared to I guess how things used to be done in the past. Um, we, we've seen that many governments are are either, either trying to or are doing pretty well at adapting to some of the some of the developments in crypto. Not all of it, because as Graham said, even even people who are inside the industry can't adapt to the developments quickly enough. Um, but clearer regulation and kind of having having clearer positions and knowing where you stand. Uh, would make things easier. Passportization, uh, this is specifically an issue within the EU at the moment. There's, there's just so much segmentation in the regulation, the regulatory environments, and, and in general, kind of international law. It, it's, um, we're, we're very much, um, as a cryptocurrency, as a worldwide cryptocurrency business, we're very, we are very much a worldwide business, and it's very hard to navigate the different requirements of different jurisdictions and um, it would be nice to see more standards and to have clearer pathways, I would say. Um, just, and then just to build on what, what Connor said there, I mean, one of, one of the terms that we use is, uh, is coin hygiene. Uh, one of the, the beauties of this technology is if I send Rachel some Bitcoin, we can see where it's come from because it's a public ledger and we can trace it all the way back through all of the original transactions, all the way back to the original block that it was, it was mined from. And then each of the public addresses associated with those transactions, we can attach a flag to them. And then we can, we can look at the, you know, whether that public address is associated with something questionable. So what we can do is we can build coin hygiene data for our transactions. Um, and um, this data is out there. I mean, we've got these, the, you know, our coin scanning companies who are all well known and they've got the, you know, they aggregate this data. Um, I think what would be, um, you know, a real step in the right direction is if we, you know, we, we, we understand what these hygiene benchmarks looks like, these hygiene benchmarks look like, and we publish them, and then that will provide, you know, a greater, it takes this veil away, uh, and it provides a lot greater degree of transparency in terms of, you know, how good, how clean are the different, uh, different entities in the ecosystem. And, and Hayden, actually, I have a question to you about the one. That one. Um, out of your experience, uh, when, when you talk about hygiene and the coin hygiene, if you were to compare it with traditional finance, out of your experience, would you say that crypto, on average, is actually uh, that kind of it's less bad, worse? Well, what have you seen? It's it's it, we had a very interesting experience uh, over the last couple of months uh, where we looked at an entity. Um, that we were looking to engage with. And what, what we do is we, we um, and this isn't PwC policy, but it's, um, but it's a step that we take as a, uh, as, a, as a measure to look at the hygiene of entities. We scanned uh, a large number of their public addresses. And what came back was flags associated with questionable activity that, were, that was attached to, to that particular entity. And what was interesting was that if you, you know, a professional services company would go into a regulated deposit taker 
and solve the money laundering issues that they've got. Okay, and that's not unheard of, and it does happen to to you know banks globally and professional services bodies are asked to go with the professional bodies, uh, professional services companies are asked to go in and fix the problems that they've got. The problem they have is they don't have transparency with respect to where this questionable money has come from, right? Our experience was that we, we had advanced visibility of where these public addresses were and some of the activities that they could be linked to. So I'd argue that where we're going is, is, is you know, I, I, I'll, use, I'll use the term carefully, but this, there, there is almost a superior level of transparency that you can achieve with this technology as compared to, you know, traditional fiat cash, uh, cash-like transactions. And it's probably on that. It's probably JP, actually, who can maybe pick up as our, as our, as our payments expert. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the good thing about um, the payment industry, it's going to do some huge leaps in innovation at the moment, uh, which means that, you know, we can benefit from, from what's happening within payments and move that into, into our lessons with regard to cryptocurrencies. Um, back to Constantine's point, you know, we work in many regulated markets. Um, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a huge burden for us, but having certainly having clarity on those regulations going forward is key and fundamental. Um, and, you know, as an emerging product, we, we, we probably see that happening more and more. Um, for us, you know, um, yeah, having, having a greater level of, of data, a greater level of intelligence on some of these transactions, providing a greater level of security around some of these, these transactions is key. Uh, we certainly want to be offering a, a secure, safe, safe method for, for clients to be using their, their cryptocurrencies going forward. Not, uh, not just the technology as well. I think there's a there's a cultural bit that I think is always underplayed and talking about, you know, what more we can do. I think education is a big part and it's not just the industry. It frustrates me. Journalists, uh, regulators come out with statements that are pretty inconsistent. You know, they're quick to highlight the volatility of Bitcoin or, or, or bucket every cryptocurrency in the same volatility, even though there are a number of equities and, and other asset classes in there. But also, for example, there was a, a 600 million hack the other day, you know, which was widely reported. I think it even made it to the top of BBC. It was all over the place. What wasn't noted on there that was pretty much within a couple of hours it being on Twitter, some individuals in the crypto space that immediately logged to the transactions worked out where they were there was a call to arms from pretty much every exchange out there that immediately sought to block the wallets where they were sent and the hacker returned all i think all pretty much all of the money in in next to no time as well which was well underreported so i think there's a huge failing here there's a failing to there's a failing to give a fair and balanced view which would be asked of any other financial services company but in the wrong direction highlighting all the negatives without saying actually this was pretty incredible the speed at which this fraud was turned around Absolutely. Uh, I, it's, it is really quite amazing, you know, the ways, Hayden, like that you were saying that we can actually have more transparency, more security in the cryptocurrency industry than in many aspects of traditional finance. And, and Graham, that's a perfect example of exactly that, that this huge $600 million hack happened. And then I think almost within 24 or 48, 48 hours, um, it, the matter was basically resolved. Um, but those things aren't quite as sexy as, you know, reporting just that the heck happened or just that this is uh, money that terrorists use or money that people use to buy drugs. So changing that narrative is, is obviously very important. And, um, and uh, especially for institutional investors who, who are circling, have been circling the space, who are interested, who are increasingly entering the space, I would argue. Um, I, but what, what I'd like to ask you all next is how important is it that institutional investors become involved in cryptocurrency in a big way? And, and also, how does that, how does the narrative need to change in order for that to happen? And, and how will that change the narrative as well? Well, it, it definitely is beneficial, uh, as, as we see it at least, is beneficial for the institutionals to um, be more proactive in, in the cryptocurrency market. It, it essentially makes markets more efficient. Um, retail investors are, are far less um, um, rational about their decisions, let's put it that way. Uh, institutionals are in general much more professional and rational, and that means that the markets become, there's, there's less inefficiencies left in the market, they become more efficient, that means there's less volatility, that means stability, uh, that means greater adoption by retail and less uh, less of the number of bad stories of, of kind of negative negative uh, 
conditions that Graham was talking about, so if the volatility was was decreased. But uh, however, at the same time, the, the the reason why the institutionals are interested in in these markets is because of the volatility, because that's where you make money. So it's it's a bit of a paradigm, I think. And and the two worlds need each other. The retail and the institutional they need to come together, ideally in 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 joint markets and that creates that element of um i would say organized chaos maybe uh which allows everybody to um to to uh, to have well to to prosper and to grow on on that i think it's a it's a it's a precondition for uh you know continued growth because at the moment um there is you know obviously we've got communities of, of coin holders uh you know principally retail investors and obviously there is there is the, the hedge fund component as well but it's but on a relative basis given you know global institutional holdings you know it, it's a very small percentage relative to the kind of capital that the, the big institutions have got uh you know and, and to con's point you know that's where the big capital is and it's that what it's that level of capital that will really bring this market to maturity because we'll have the liquidity and we'll have you know reductions in in volatility but um but i think there's an interesting dimension to that because i think there's one of accountability because at the moment um you know as, as a venture that is you know as ventures that are seeking to be to be recognized they're held accountable by the regulator obviously the regulate regulatory frameworks need to mature but actually, there's 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 a wholesale investor opportunity to kind of step in and hold these projects accountable as well. You see, so it, you know there is a sort of a bi-directionality there in terms of accountability, which I think whilst there is accountability from a retail perspective, which is there, but actually as soon as we plug the wholesale component in and hold these ventures accountable, that's really going to drive the sector to you know higher levels of performance and aspiration, which I think can be be only beneficial for everybody. Yeah, so interesting on the institutions as well, because I think when we talk about what brings them, um, which is obviously a good question because we would all like them here, but one of the points for us as well is, you know, they've got a stark choice. They they either come or they get displaced. And, you know, if you, we think of exchanges as institutions, we'll see extra in exchange there here. You know, there's some huge ones out there, FTX, Bitpanda, Coinbase. They are large world players now. They're institutions themselves. And outside of those, I know several entities working towards building banks, CSDs, clearing houses. There are tons of asset managers in the space already, some managing hundreds of millions, in, in some cases billions. So the institutions that, that are existing in the traditional space really, you know, they, they really need to take a look at what's going on and say, OK, if we don't take part, then the new players are going to emerge and we're going to be too late to move into it. So it's really important that they come in. But if they don't, uh, you only need to take a look at DeFi to see the amount of innovation that's happening there. All of the current products that are in existence are being rethought up, sometimes sometimes not necessarily in the right way and without the correct regulation, but the innovation is there for all to see. So uh, I'm, I, I would like them to come, but if they don't, then someone else will be there, I'm pretty certain. We're certainly seeing interest with our client base, and you know it's well publicised that some of the some of the large T ones across the globe uh, are interested in into getting into cryptocurrencies and coming up with their own strategies. Um, you know, and we're here to help help them move forward and, and leverage that as much as we can. Definitely. Just just right, just one final thought, you see, because I think I think there is a strong case to say. I mean, you know, the, 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 this is hugely innovative technology. And, you know, relative to, you know, the traditional investment portfolio options that you've got in terms of the tech that's already out there, this is, you know, the, 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 this has the potential because you, know, you bring together payment and ledger, store of value and conditions in one place. No other technology, short of radio potentially, has been sort of as, as transformational as that. It's hugely important in terms of what we can do, you know, to take out, you know, Frictional inefficiencies in the economy. You know, forgive me, JP, but you know the cost of a payment does not, in of itself, add value in an economy. So if we can take, we can remove that. You can use that money to spend on things like education and nurses and other wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, social social good. It's certainly a step change, without a doubt.
Yeah, these in institutional involvement as well, you know, because we, we speak often to, to auditors and banks and you, you find people like Hayden who are, you know, embracing the space, uh, uh, you know, and love what we're doing and genuinely believe in it as well. And, and you go to speak to the institutions and you meet two, three people that are behind you and then you try and do business or in most cases, try and open a bank account and then you're denied just for having crypto somewhere on your website for, for absolutely no reason. And then banks hide behind this thin veil of um you know there's a risk-based reason and we can't tell you what it is because you know they're kind of loosely relying on money laundering rules and in our case for the past three years even though we focused on securities and we had more regulations than most companies in the uk we still really struggled so i think you know a uh, at a, at a ground level the regulators can do more to encourage the industry i mean especially in the uk as well right you know we've gone through brexit we've moved out of europe we're a fintech hub of the world a financial center there's probably the biggest marked change happening in the space and we're we're doing we're doing something but we're not embracing it as well as we could i'm glad you mentioned the banking uh, issue uh, graham because we again we're uh, we're a large exchange we we are well regulated around the world but opening up bank accounts is extremely important uh, and th there's multiple implications that come out of that. If you haven't got, uh, say, a UK-based bank account, then it, it limits what you can do within the UK. Uh, you can't go to a bank to raise debt, for example. So one of the things that, that uh, many don't realize is the majority of cryptocurrency businesses do not, cannot rely on any debt, and they have to survive on their own profits or, or raise equity, uh, e equity financing, which is a very much not a level playing field against other um, startups, other businesses. And, and uh, what would be really great actually is to see uh, governments stepping in. And I'm not just talking UK, but like Singapore is a very similar situation. I think it's, there is some changes and some progress in Singapore, but in general, pretty much all around the world, uh, the regulation of crypto has moved forward, uh, but the, um, there's still banks have way too much flexibility for denying access to, to bank accounts uh, for cryptocurrency related businesses. And I, I hope governments um, intervene and, and influence this. Yeah, there's got to be a shift in mindset, hasn't there, for, this, for these, these new technologies, these new payment types. Um, it's a common problem with a lot of these banks with their, their legacy policies and processes. Um, you know, they, they have to work around them in some cases. John, John Paul, on your side, what um, what made you start taking on crypto clients? Because you're a large institution, you probably didn't need to, but you've obviously seen the shift and got comfortable. Yeah, um, FIs is a very broad business. So, you know, we service capital markets, um, FIs as well, and issuers. Um, from an issuer perspective, we see a lot more interest. There's a lot more crypto exchanges that have started issuing cane, uh, cards uh, just to enable the, the use of a fiat currency. Um, to get, get crypto back into everyday use, essentially. But we are seeing growth again, as I mentioned earlier, within our acquiring business, um, within our e-commerce business. I know cryptocurrencies are one of our largest customers, a number of our largest customers, in, in, in fact. Um, and we want to innovate with across the breadth of the FIS capability, also in capital markets as well, to see how we can leverage some of our investments in roadmap going forward. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I love this point uh, that, that we all seem to be making, which is about mindset, um, especially coming from, from governments. And, and I'm just curious, uh, uh, can any of you point to any examples of where you see effective regulation taking place, where you see regulators working closely in tandem with industry players to make real change happen? Yeah. There are um, there are examples. I'm, I, I wouldn't want to to point to a specific uh, jurisdiction, but I know that there are regulators out there that um, uh, you know what they've been doing is you know developing specific frameworks as it relates to issuers, exchanges, custodians, wallet providers. Okay, and I think that the the, the entry point has to be greater than just the sort of simple money laundering directives, because I think there's a lot more that we can apply in there in terms of the operational control, the governance, you know, which third parties are you using to provide your, your, your services into you. But also, you know, you've got the, 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 um, the best consultation as it relates to uh, prudential uh, requirements. So the requirement to hold capital on the balance sheet. Uh, I mean, they came out at, a, this is a consultation, but they've come out as a 1250% risk weighted um, value for crypto so that means as, as, a, as a bank 
you've got to hold you know bitcoin on a one-to-one -one basis with capital on your balance sheet so that's an eight percent capital adequacy requirement which is pretty tough okay mm -hmm. um now is that a positive thing well i mean i'd argue that you know if if we want to be if people want to be part of the you know big boys big girls club as as it relates to the global financial ecosystem then step up form a queue you know you've got to get on with it because this is you know we're talking about big important things here um you know we, we, we're sort of 12 years away from the last financial crisis and i don't think anybody ever wants that to happen again um and bad things happen in finance you know there's some awful things happen you know things like hirschat risk where you have this sort of collective failure of payments through through a supply chain. So, so you know the regulators have got a tough ask, and I've got every sympathy for what what they what they what they're required to do. But what they do is they mesh it with a sandbox. Mm -hmm. What they do is that they uh, sort of work in in tandem with developing, applying these regulatory supervisory frameworks, and then take entities through a, a sandbox process. And then that way, everybody can learn. And, you know, I think that the, the FCA under you know, Andrew Bailey's original leadership was, was pretty progressive in terms yeah. of sort of having the original sandbox capability. Um, so, you know, all of this is, is sort of stepping into, into the unknown. Um, I, think, I think, you know, the, the challenge I would make is that what we can't do is stifle innovation uh, because it's great to have the freedom, uh, but... Um, but sometimes we have to restrain that uh, because sometimes freedom freedom is not not such a good thing. But there are good examples out there, and um, you know I think I think the UK is doing a pretty good job of what is a you know complex ecosystem, and uh, you know we we will get there in the end. Yeah, I, I think our starting point on this for regulators was you know this innovation whilst you know crypto has been around for a while, coming in size came in, in more recent years, and there was you know a catch-all approach at the, at the start of okay let's regulate cryptocurrency and and, it, and everyone most people just thought okay this is a new asset class everything is a new asset class but but actually it's increasingly clear to everyone that this is definitely a new technology and using that to new technology there are some new asset classes like i would argue bitcoin is a new type of asset class you know you can argue it's a number of different things but i feel like it's fairly new but securities securities just just choose to have their books and books and records on a blockchain rather than a spreadsheet is still a security yeah it, it, the same for debt as well the same for privately held things i mean even even if you were to fractionalize a property in the past you could still put it in an spv and issue equity or debt so a lot of the time we've kind of said okay everything needs to be regulated in the space whereas what we probably should have done is said okay your securities and, and we'll add a line in here that says and if you're going to house those securities on a blockchain you need to pay attention to these two new lines of regulation but everything else applies and then for and then come up with regulation which is specifically applicable to to things like bitcoin or uh, and you know move stable coins more in the direction of e-money and, and digital securities more in the direction of securities and it's it's just created this huge confusion that you know in the uk for an example if you're a broker that trades on any platform platform uh, if you're in fact if you're a broker that trades securities you need to be regulated and as part of those regulations you need to satisfy anti-money laundering rules if you trade crypto you need to go a whole through and the whole through a whole another exercise to trade this new instrument you don't have it for any other instrument suddenly you have to demonstrate everything else again but really all they needed to ask was okay for this additional asset class what extra checks do you do on chain so you know i think it's just um it, you know, I, I agree with hayden that, that it was progressive and and it, and it felt like it was moving in the right direction but for some reason it just feels to be floundering around a bit now and i think it's because they started from the wrong wrong place and it's harder to adapt it now than to rethink it i think to add to this as well uh, uh, very good points hayden and graham uh, however as you mentioned graham what is happening with DeFi is, is a different level of innovation. Like people are building financial institutions on chain. Uh, there's potentially no limit, really. You can build credit institutions. And, uh, and I always, the way I think about this is imagine, imagine if the government takes, uh, for the CBDC technology, if they take something like Ethereum or any other blockchain which allows for smart contracts and potentially issuance of NFTs as well, um, do we even need the financial sector then? It could all be run in, in programs and all the profits could be redistributed back to the population. It's, it's a bit utopian or anti-utopian, I'm not sure which way, but uh, it, it, that's coming, kind of coming back to that step innovation. Um, I think it, it's going to be very hard for, for the regulation to 
uh, to keep up with innovation. And we can see this very clearly in DeFi, the innovation is just, just going way, way faster than anywhere else. Um, and I always, um, my, my view has always been that there will be a time at which you would, you would almost need to have a code of practice of some sorts. Um, it, it may even be in code, I, I don't know, but it, it, rather than building regulation, there may be some sort of general practices and general rules around the world that everybody should follow. Um, it, it gets more complicated when you, once the CBDCs are up, then uh, I'm sure some governments will want to come together and use the same technology to build um, intra, um, uh, intra government uh, connections between sharing documents and sharing, I don't know, birth certificates, whatever it might be. And, and the technology is kind of there already with DeFi. Just to um, just pick up on a couple of things. And, and just, just for those, I don't know how familiar the audience is with, with some of the principles in DeFi, but, but um, it is, it's an incredibly powerful technology. And I said, you know, cryptocurrencies gives you the ability to bring payment ledger, store of value and conditionality together in one place. Uh, so Ethereum is a classic example. Uh, but what that means is that we can create these protocols. So if I send Rachel something, the release of that something is conditional on Rachel releasing something to me. So if I give Rachel the, the deeds for my house, Rachel can advance money to me that I can use to buy my house. And then Rachel holds those deeds as security in relation to that loan. Well, that is called a mortgage. Um, and this is what DeFi can do. So DeFi will take one asset class and it will release another asset class in return, which is hugely powerful. And you can, we can spin up one of these in sort of 24 hours without too much difficulty. Um, it raises all sorts of very interesting and difficult challenges because, you know, I pose the question, how do you regulate something that doesn't have a legal entity associated with it? So there's no beneficial owner. So it's completely decentralized. So, who do you blame if it goes wrong? All sorts of interesting and very difficult regulatory problems. And just to just close on that, the, um, there is, there is one, one um, and I mentioned radio, but radio is one of the few things that, that's out there that is actually globally regulated. So when Marconi developed radio back in the sort of the 19, 1910, 1920, the, the countries of the world came together and they set up the International Telecommunications Union because they realized this sort of the transmission of radio waves that you know, permeate the world. They needed some kind of control, some kind of governance, some kind of regulatory authority. And that's how the International Telecommunications Union was, um, was created. And I think to Con's point, you know, that may be ultimately where we end up, that we need some kind of global standard setter as it relates to you know, the, way this, the way this technology is used. I mean, John Paul, I, I don't know what, what your view is on that, as a, um, I mean, you're, 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 you're one of the biggest world global payment infrastructure providers, so you, you must have a perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the key thing, going back to Constantine's point in terms of the pace of change and innovation, um, you know, the, these regulations, I mean, again, you know, we operate in many regulated markets. In some markets, we actually engage directly with, with the regulators. So we have visibility and insight into changes that are coming, coming down the track. Um, it, it's very important that there's clarity. It goes, it goes without doubt. I mean, we're fortunate from our, our perspective, you know, a lot of our businesses are very mature. Uh, we have a very good understanding of regulations, but again, as we move into some of these new, new entrant, new emerging economies, then it is gonna create further demand for, for organizations such as CX and obviously for, for processes such as FIS. Definitely. And I, I, I love uh, Hayden, something that you said earlier about, uh, uh, about how, you know, basically we can recreate the financial system in a way that rewards participants and is, is actually used to, to better society. And I think DeFi is a great example of that. Um, you know, many, I think all DeFi platforms essentially take fees and, and you know, whatever other money that they collect and, and pass it back out to their users. Um, I'm very curious, since all of you have your feet on the ground in this world in different ways uh, in cryptocurrency, um, what have you observed in terms of how institutional investors and clients um, are interacting with the DeFi world? What are what are sort of their their thoughts and opinions on it? Do they want to be involved? Um, do they feel threatened by it? What's the deal? So what what we have seen is uh, that there's a lot of interest. 
they um i think that at least our clients our institutional clients are very much interested in DeFi uh for various reasons there's there's first of all this uh, it's really very lucrative and there's a lot of opportunities and there's there's some interesting propositions uh like for example you can you can put uh USD uh, based stable coins into liquidity pool and generate maybe 12, 15, 20% annualized return with pretty much zero risk. Well, it's not zero because there are some smart contract risks, et cetera, but, but still it's very, very hard to achieve that in traditional instruments. Uh, it's, it's much harder to package the same deal. Um, so we we're seeing, seeing a, a lot of interest as it is, I think the main challenge is, as uh, Hayden was saying, well, um, many of the regulated institutions have to have, they cannot get involved with DeFi directly. Um, and and this, this is a bit of a gray area. Um, can you actually involve with a counterparty like this? Um, because how do you onboard them? How do you do due diligence on, on the DeFi project? And I think um, our view, uh, our strategy and our view is that there will be gateways into DeFi, and we hope that we will become one of them, uh, where, where um, the other institutions would operate with a regulated counterparty. And we, as a subject matter expert, can, um, um, can check and, and verify that the selection of DeFi venues that we've selected are the good ones uh, based on uh, various metrics. Uh, it could be audits or smart contracts. It could be social media presence. It could be... Um, um, how long they've been in the market for, etc. The, the, this is all remains. This all remains to be seen, I guess. And that comes back to that kind of code of conduct uh, that I was talking about, rather than regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's the way we believe um, things will probably develop. That institutions will find gateways and, and specialists that can allow them access to these markets. On, on, the, on the institution side, Rachel, just in terms of what an institution is I think different people use it for different things as well in, in the kind of hedge fund world from before I would think of it as endowments pensions large banks but in crypto I think more people use it to mean non non-individuals as well so I think that you know almost within that there's two groups and I think those that are crypto favorable you know the kind of I don't know Pantera's of this world that are you know a corporate that are clearly embracing the space and trading it and doing well you know they're obviously not fearful of the area at all but if you go and look at some of the largest pension plans in the world there is absolutely no way they're going to go and mix in those pools and the largest reason for that is because of the absence of ML KYC like I I love DeFi I'm you know one of the people on the planet that's completely behind it and can't wait to see what happens but i can also sit there and appreciate that markets came before regulation and having a pool of capital moving the way around the way it does there is some bad activity that happens in there and if you're an institution you, you just don't want to be near it and in fact you can even be considered to be complicit in it so um it always surprises me when um when large private equity firms with big esg statements go out and invest directly into into large DeFi platforms without making more of a statement how they want to see better regulation because i think they're they're knowingly participating in pools that are absent of it so i think some are some are in the space and i think everyone's desperate to get into it but the key is what constantine said is that they want to know they can get in in the right way so if someone can create liquidity pools where all participants are known uh, you know auto automated market makers are trading in a in a kind of fair market way that then they'll definitely get involved but until they have um absolute conviction that their reputation is not a risk they're, they're just not going to mm -hmm. one, one of the cool things we can do and we've talked about sort of coin hygiene and we've talked about public addresses but um one of the one of the large global uh, scanning uh, companies that are out there one of the products that they offer is um so i send something to rachel's uh, investment pool it's uh, you know maybe a large volume of bitcoin um, it's come from a public address and let's say it's been hacked or it's been um, it's associated with activities that are a bit questionable. Um, before Rachel accepts it into her public address, we, we can scan the originating public address and then we can put a block on it so that um, you know, we can prevent that transaction from happening. And that way we're improving all of the hygiene so you can prevent these assets coming in in advance of um the, the you know the, the the actual transaction settling so so again it's about transparency it's a different level of hygiene that we can apply to uh, to this sort of technology and john paul do you have anything to add as well no, I, I, th I think the guys have covered it to, to be honest where we are in the in the supply chain i probably don't come across DeFi as much as i should do so 
Where I'll, I'll I'll bow to the the other contributors on this one. Sure, sure. So 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 my my next question would be, uh, you know, right now the conversation sort of seems to be about institutions finding ways to to access DeFi. Uh, you know, whether it be through data hygiene, um, through dil due diligence, you know, finding resources that can help them access the space in a way that's um, comfortable for them. What do you think that the longer term uh, relationship between sort of the institutional traditional world of, of finance uh, and payments uh, is going to be with the world of DeFi once we get past this phase of, or this, this phase, excuse me, of, of how, we, how do we access it in the first place? I, I think I've already expressed my opinion to a point that, that I think um, if, if, if it works out the way I have it in my mind, the innovation will carry on in the DeFi in this unregulated kind of separate world, mm -hmm. uh, which may be somehow connected into the institutional world. Uh, but I think where the uh, the big shifts will happen in the institutional world is, is once that innovation has been trialed and tested, it can be very easily taken and applied in regulated environments. And uh, that's why I mentioned, uh, for example, I don't know, like, let's say a government wants to um, increase um, consumer spending in an economy. Well, with, with central bank digital currencies, they can very easily target who gets what check. And you can have it based on a condition. You can, you can have that money, which is spendable in certain um, vet vendors, but not the others. So you couldn't just go and buy, buy some saving. I don't know, put it in a savings account. Uh, but if, if you spent it on a high street shop, then, then it becomes available. Um, and again, the profits of that could be redistributed in, in some ways. So all of these things are available in DeFi already. And I, I hope that that is what will happen, that we'll start, we'll use some of that innovation for the greater good. Absolutely. I, I think that's absolutely spot on. I mean, you know, I think that the, I mean, it's, it's worth, you know, taking a little bit of time and actually looking at some of the papers that the, the Bank of Bank of England have written on central bank digital currencies. And I think that one of the earliest papers that they wrote on Bitcoin was was authored by Roger Clues back in I think it was 2016, might be 2015. Uh, but they're very good papers. Uh, I mean, anything the bank puts out is, is is always very well written, and you know, the, the the content on central bank digital currencies and digital currencies is very useful and it's a very good entry point into into the space. But but, the, but look at the way the central bank's thinking has developed over the last sort of five, six years now. We're now at a place where, you know, Rishi Sunak's announcing a task force for a central bank digital currency working group mm -hmm. to launch a UK-based central bank digital currency. Now, that's a big settlement rail, right? So think of what that does from a wholesale perspective to all of our capital markets, but also from a retail perspective, albeit it's a very strong policy point that we retain both cash, because actually we will need cash for to address the problem of digital exclusion, but also, you know, we've got a big retail banking networks out there. So the CBDC will be the place upon which these this this innovate these innovations of of, of DeFi will sit and will reference and will move money from 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 party to party in a retail or, or a wholesale context. Definitely. So. So let's talk for a moment just from, from the other side of this question, which is um, how will institutional investors develop uh, or contribute to the development of, of DeFi as well as cryptocurrency? What does their growing presence in this market mean uh, for the future of this technology? I think they're already looking at uh, they're um they're all you know it started a few years ago that they'd have one or two people talking about blockchain projects and most of them have quite substantial projects in place now some of them are working in partnership with custodian exchanges and protocols that are in existence and, and some are building their own private ones as well um, and and whether it's talking about on-chain settlement passing collateral between banks you know they're they're starting to appreciate the technology and, and some of them are starting to appreciate the the, the public chains as well so i think they're um, they're doing their own thing in, internally and then they'll start moving more outwardly focusing but just on the central bank digital currency point most things banks do are regulated and and a lot of activity in crypto you know sweeping generalization but let's just say crypto faces um stable coins usdt usdc whatever it might be there is some 
there is fiat activity, but because the on and off ramps are so difficult, a lot of the activity and, and transfer of value takes place on stable coins. Um, and, you know, if you look at something like Tether, I mean, you can have your own opinion of it, but a bank's probably not going to go near it. So the second you have a central bank digital currency, it totally unlocks delivery versus payment transfer of value. You know, everything John Paul does can be exactly the same with a central bank digital currency and, and suddenly it's all digital. So it, it really is a bit of a, a bit of a game changer. It brings all of the regulated activity into play. Uh, and it also means that it also increases the power of DeFi. So to Constantine's point just now, um, if you're if you're an individual and you've got any collateral, well, you could take it to the bank and try and get a loan and fill in a bunch of forms, but you can probably just as easily go and make a, 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 a make a DAO contract or or go on to DeFi, give your Bitcoin up, protected by a smart contract and receive central bank digital currency that you can actually go and spend in the real world. Whereas right now you'd have to go and get DAI, convert it on exchange, find a bank to take your cash out to be of any use. So it actually makes, you know, DeFi actually more world, real world friendly once you have a, a credible stable coin behind it. John Paul, do you have uh, anything to add since uh, since you were? Well, I, I think Graham hit the nail on the head. To be honest, yeah, yeah. You know, again, the pace of changing innovation. This is going to open far more opportunities for institutional investors and and, and other organisations as well. It just uh, just reminds me. I think Graham Graham used the term cash and getting back getting cash. I remember. I think this is when Bitcoin was sort of peaking about seven thousand bucks. But I walked through uh, Old Street Roundabout. Um, there's an underpass there, and I don't know if it's still there actually, but there was one of the few Bitcoin machines. And I remember seeing a queue of people snaking out, and there was a guy at the front who had a big stack of £20 notes feeding into this Bitcoin ATM. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's a true story. It's a true story. And, uh, and there, there was a whole queue, and it's, it's like a little soup restaurant underneath in the underpass. I remember yeah, it. It's, uh, it's, those were the days. Well, th those were the days, but I think there are more days to come. Smart guy, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, I, you know, back in the days when Bitcoin was only $7,000. Um, totally switching gears here. Uh, we have a question from the audience, uh, which is for all of your thoughts on the upcoming launch of Libra, formerly Libra, now DM. What do you think uh, about the project and how it's developed and, and how it will affect the world now that it's that it's upcoming? I think it's going to be even more disruptive. I don't, we, we, we've not seen anything yet, to be honest with you, because um, I used to, I mean, and, and again, you know, respect to JP's wonderful company, but, um, the, you know, um, a payment is a message, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, a social media platform is a messaging platform. So actually we can do payments on social media platforms. And, you know, what they've been waiting for is, um, is things like stable coins. So, and, you know, Facebook's reach is what I think about two two billion people or thereabouts. So, so I, I I think this is this is we haven't seen anything yet in terms of what will happen there. I mean, they, I think they've worked hard to 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 acquire the right level of regulation, but um, but this is going to open up a whole new panacea of of consumer online consumer goods opportunities. It would, you know, it's going to change the way online works completely. Yeah, it's the the I. It's frustrating. I find it a bit frustrating because, I, you know, actually, I kind of want to say I don't think it will be a success. And the reasons that I'd say that is that um, they went about it the wrong way at the start. They did exactly what Archex never does, which is, you know, come out and basically say we're bigger than regulation. This is going to happen anyway. And then you suddenly realize you can't say that the regulators come after you and, and you have to operate within the rules. And that's a bad starting place for anyone that's trying to build a good business. Uh, and so the conversation we've just had, I think you've kind of got stable coins on one end. You've got um, central bank digital currencies on the other. And then you'll have our tax who can custody cash issuing um, stable coins on our side. So it feels like they fit into a strange place. However, all that being said, it's Facebook. I think they process something like 100 billion of payments a year. And if they want this to work, it's just going to work. It'll, it will be the digital currency of their platform. And then they'll build partnerships. So um, it's, uh, you know, I don't. If they weren't so big, I think it would be a failure, but they can set the narrative, frankly. And, and, and I think it will receive some, it will certainly receive some adoption in some corners and maybe even further. And, and Graham, just to add to this, I think we've seen at least two instances. Uh, one is Libra, the other one is Telegram and, and the Telegram token. Um, both went with the idea that we, we don't care what regulation is, we're bigger than that and both failed. Um, and at the same time, uh, we 
we have seen payment methods work really well within social media platform in China. So it, it, I think they have a, a really, really good opportunity. It's about how they go about it. And I would love for it to succeed. I, but I, again, like Graham, I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a little bit too late. It's, it's very much, I think it's not clear cut as to whether they will succeed or not. I would have loved for them to succeed. And um, in, in, for many reasons, um, it's, it's the unbanked, it's, it's the developing world as well. It's, it's the inclusivity um, and, and a, I don't know, availability of credits and things like that, that, that should really change. And, and the, the biases in the developed economies, so it's very easy for us because we, we're, all, we're all in London, for example, it's very easy for us. But when, you, when you've seen how the rest of the world lives, it's nowhere near as easy. And it, you can very much see why cryptocurrencies are much more popular in economies where there's, say, hyperinflations, instabilities in the government. And um, there's, there's limited access to other currencies which are more stable, like the USD, for because their own governments want to control and protect their own, uh, their own economies and, and things like that. So, uh, again, coming back to this idea that the, the, the idea of countries will start to blur away. And uh, if, if Facebook, Libra, DM, whatever you want to call it, if they, if they succeed, and that's probably one of the reasons why they didn't succeed in the start, because... Uh, Frankly, one of the well, the largest economy in the world, the USA, thought that that's that's a risk, that's a threat to the existing um, to the way things are done currently. So, uh, well, it remains to be seen, I guess. But it, it'd be great if if something positive was to happen out of it. Yeah, I, I agree. And back to Hayden's earlier point, I think it's also an element of disruption. But but all change is good. And Facebook being Facebook, I'm sure they drive it through. I think it's interesting that a couple of his members uh, bailed out fairly early. I think PayPal and MasterCard and eBay. Um, so I think they're going to drive some positive change um, if they're successful. Very, very interesting, definitely, what's going to happen there. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left uh, in our hour here. So I have one more question for you all. Before I ask that question, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, each of you, to just say shortly where our audience can find out a little bit more about each of you and the work that you do. So uh, we'll start with with Hayden and just go uh, uh, counterclockwise for me. So Hayden, John Paul, Constantine, and Graham, uh, just a little bit about where people can find you. So Hayden, go ahead. Yeah, so very simple. Um, so PwC Crypto into Google, and that takes you to our global crypto services website. So it's got all of our resources, the different teams that we've got globally. And then I'm on LinkedIn, Hayden Jones, how's your IDN? So great to connect with anybody. Thank you. John Paul. Yeah, and for me, uh, fisglobal.com is our primary website. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn as well. We've got a couple of experts that are, are developing with our business as well, and certainly one of the leads from our, our European side is Mashfi Khan. So again, reach out to him. You can probably connect to him through, through LinkedIn. Thank you. And Constantine. Um, cx.io is, is our website. That's where you see all of our offerings. Uh, for the institutional listeners, it's prime.cx.io, which you can find from the main website as well. Uh, but that's a shortcut to directly to the institutional offering. And obviously, I'm on LinkedIn by my name, Konstantin Anisimov, and I'm on Twitter as well. It's Anisimov K1. Thank you. And Graham. So, yeah, you can find us on rtax.com, contact us through that. You can contact me directly through LinkedIn or, or any other method you can find me on. We're, we're pretty open and, and love chatting to anyone who's looking into the space, deep, deep into the space or, or really thinks they can work with us in any way. You know, really open to, to more conversations. Thank you. And so now for my final question for each of you, uh, which is in 60 seconds or less, uh, if there's one point that you hope that people take away from this webinar, this discussion today, what is that point? And we'll go in the same order. So Hayden, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> this, this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know. So you think about that first radio communication that Marconi did from, from Cornwall across the U.S., this is this is what we're seeing. This this is just the first baby steps in, in terms of what this technology is going to do. And there's massive opportunity here for us to to release all this frictional lag in the economy and uh, make things better for people. Thank you, uh, John Paul. Yeah, just to, to echo Hayden's thoughts. Um, you know, the pace of change is incredible, and it's incredible across payments, but even more so when we start looking at the, these cryptocurrencies. 
um, and all change is good. You know, it opens up a huge range of opportunities, and we're very excited about the, uh, the possibilities. Thank you, and um, Constantine. So th there's a couple of things I'd like to say here. Uh, first of all, I think we've, we've mentioned explosion a couple of times in terms of explosion of innovation. Uh, we, we're certainly at an inflection point. Uh, but in addition to that, I'd also like to uh, say a phrase that I've, I can't remember where I've heard it, uh, but I always like, uh, I always come back to that. We, we overestimate progress in the short term and we underestimate progress in the long term. It, it's always... It's almost like you wake up and, and you realize, oh, I have an iPhone. I can watch videos on my phone. And, and you don't remember how that happened. You, <laughs> like kind of a couple of years before that, you just had a phone with keys. And I think it's going to be something like that, where we, uh, the innovation for the general public, the innovation trickles in, trickles in, trickles in. And then one day, um, the, I don't know, a general population may be doing I don't know, receiving birth certificates on via NFT technology. Mm. And, and this will probably happen without the majority of people even realizing that has happened. Yeah, very true. And Graham? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, a lot of good things have been said. I think, you know, encouraging people to, to be open-minded. There's a lot going on in the space. You may not believe in, you know, is Bitcoin going to be the currency of the world? Is DeFi the future of innovation? But but certainly the people in the space, um, you know, believe it wholeheartedly. So, I, you know, the only thing I would say is if there's, if there's anyone watching who, who's not a believer, then spend some more time looking into it put some money into the system, move it around, and you'll start to see uh, what you're able to do. And if after that you're convinced, then tell as many people as you can. <laughs> Thank but you. That's, that's not investment oh, yes, advice. Yes, yes. That's not investment advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> None of this is investment advice. <laughs> exactly. Okay, guys. Thank you all so much. Truly a wonderful, very insightful discussion. I'm sure that our audience got a lot out of it. I know that I did for sure. So thank you to all of you. And thank you to our audience members who joined us today. Remember to share this on your social media uh, and feel free to get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you all and take care. Thanks. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you so much.